Good day and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the Voice of Reason. Today we are continuing our ongoing coverage of the Russia-Ukrainian War. We've entered day 184, again 184 days of fighting. So the big news uh, that is that is coming out of a lot of media headlines right now is the report uh, out of uh, the Russian military and the uh, Kremlin as well that the Russian military will expand uh, its forces by some 130,000 troops. Now, initially there is this knee-jerk reaction that uh, uh, it is uh, because of what is taking place uh, right now with the ongoing war. Um, and it, it does have, obviously, some elements uh, to that uh, in terms of that force expansion. But you really have to look at where these forces are going. And uh, right now, it has a million-man army. That is, ten that, that is usually what you hear coming out of the mainstream media. And when you think a million man army, you immediately believe that Russia has a million forces on the ground and uh, ha ha and has the ability to deploy those forces. And again, that is just uh, a complete false narrative and you really have to understand the, uh, the true uh, size and uh, what the uh, Russian military actually looks like. So you have several components just like uh, you have here in the United States and other nations of the uh, Russian military. You have the Russian ground forces, which is about 280,000 personnel uh, at the start of, of, this, uh, of this conflict. You have the uh, Russian airborne forces, which are uh, a, a separate entity uh, outside of the ground forces. That those airborne forces, also known as the as the VDV, uh, have roughly uh, forty-five to upwards to sixty thousand personnel uh, at the start of the conflict, and then the rest of the forces are uh, spread out between the air force and the uh, the naval forces. And then you have a separate component, which is the Russian National Guard. And uh, the Russians took components of the, uh, the uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs, the internal troops, and, uh, and various other uh, federal law enforcement bodies and then combined them into the uh, Russian National Guard. It is not like the National Guard that you would, the, that you would relate to here in the United States where it's made up of reserve forces. These are active duty, full-time uh, soldiers in the Russian National Guard. So the question is, is where these uh, additional 130,000 troops are going to go? From what we understand, uh, they are going to be contract forces. They will not be conscripted forces. And uh, in all probability, uh, given what is happening on the ground and, in, and the possibility of other conflicts in the future, uh, I would say at this point, uh, it is highly likely that most of those troops will go to the, uh, the ground forces of the Russian Federation. And you will probably see the Russian ground forces going from 280,000 uh, personnel to roughly 400,000 uh, personnel. Uh, the Russians uh, don't have uh, too many uh, challenges staffing its air force and its uh, and, and to a lesser extent its uh, its navy. Uh, the real challenge is, is is going to be the expanding of those uh, those ground forces and then quite possibly the uh, airborne forces uh, as well. And I for also forgot to mention the uh, the naval infantry that is also a, a fighting force that the Russians use. Uh, they don't call them, uh, well, you could call them Marines, but the Russians call them naval infantry, coastal defense troops. And that force is, again, attached to uh, the, uh, the, the Navy and, and comprised roughly uh, 36,000 personnel in total. That includes both uh, coastal defense forces and actual the naval infantry themselves. The naval infantry are roughly 12,000 forces. But uh, again, this is going to take place uh, probably over a period of a few years uh, outside the possibility of some sort of uh, general mobilization by the Russian military if this conflict were to expand. But in terms of peacetime, that would be the direction that the Russian military is, uh, is heading uh, to uh, face uh, future threats, which obviously they perceive 
is in a westerly direction uh, at this point. Uh, so again, uh, we did not see, uh, in terms of the ongoing fighting in Ukraine, we did not see this uh, massive Independence Day attack by uh, Russian forces hitting a variety of targets uh, throughout Ukraine. That did not uh, that that threat did not manifest itself, and uh, we did see uh, a continuation of of strikes uh, not outside the normal scope of continued operations uh, that we have been seeing uh, over the past uh, half a year. I got to tell you, you know, going into this, who would have thought that uh, that a half a year later, six months later, we'd be sitting here talking about this ongoing war. Again, all the talking heads were talking about uh, this war was going to last three to four days, the Russians would be in, to, would be in Kiev, and it would be all over with. Uh, well, that, that did not pan out, and uh, obviously uh, Western intelligence, in terms of uh, the United States intelligence, was uh, way off the mark uh, in both, I would say, in assessing uh, Russian capability and, and uh, also, at the same time, the, uh, the perseverance of the uh, Russian state uh, to continue this conflict. I know uh, 30 days into the campaign, uh, we were hearing reports out of the Pentagon that the Russians could only go until about May. And, uh, and obviously, uh, that is simply, uh, simply not the case as the, uh, the war continues. Uh, we're going to continue to monitor the situation and report on what's happening on the ground. And uh, we will have more coverage uh, very, very soon. Again, thanks for joining us. Have a good day.